Hi there, and welcome to another edition of Security Ledger's Security Week in Review. I'm your host, Paul Roberts, the editor at the Security Ledger. Each week, we try to bring you some of the leading minds in technology and IT security to discuss some of the week's top cybersecurity and Internet of Things stories. And I'm really happy this week we have Ted Julian, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Co3 Systems in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Ted has a really long history working in the IT security industry, going way back to his days at At Stake, the uh, consultancy that birthed a thousand security startups. Okay. <laughs> his resume also includes uh, positions at Arbor Networks, Application Security Inc., as well as stints as a uh, analyst at IDC and Yankee Group. And his uh, latest company is Co3 Systems. Ted, uh, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about Co3 and what you guys do. Sure. Yeah, it's great to be here, Paul. Thanks um, for the invite. Great uh, to have you. Yeah. Um, so, gosh, what, the easy way to explain Co3 to an audience like the one you've got, pretty sharp security people, is um, as an industry, we've been focused quite a bit on prevention for like the last 15 years, then detection kind of more recently. And yet, despite the state of breach, everybody agrees that, that folks are sort of in. There's very little that's going on in response other than services. And so, Co3, we've built a software as a service. We'll soon have on-prem offering as well to help automate the incident response process. In a nutshell, is what we've done. And um, so, who are your customers? Like, what types of companies are seeking out Co3? Are you large enterprise? Are you small business? Yeah. Large enterprises and maybe sort of the, the medium-sized enterprises are our customers. The usual verticals that you'd expect, like financial services, uh, healthcare, retail. We've been um, really fortunate, having launched the product at RSA this year and uh, end of February, to, um, to get one of the hottest products at the show there. And uh, last quarter, we just had our strongest quarter by quite a margin. This quarter is looking really great. So it does seem like... Um, Organizations are figuring out the early adopters have already decided that their incident response capability is not where it should be, and they're actively investigating ways to improve that. And they kind of stumble across us and say, geez, we didn't even know there was a product to help with this. Right. We, we might have to build something ourselves or whatever. So right. I think, you know, as, as we look at RSA coming up in just a few months, believe it or not, I think that'll be an ongoing and continuing trend. Right. So uh, some interesting stories, you know, given Co3's uh, orientation, actually some really interesting stories in the news this week that kind of speak to what you guys do. Um, yeah. Most uh, recently, just within the last day or so, Brian Krebs over at Krebs on Security had another uh, uh, story, breaking story or scoop, uh, about a breach at... Um, Cupid Media, which is a, a company that owns a bunch of online dating sites, including uh, OkCupid. Yeah. So what? Um, and this is uh, what forty? I think he said forty million um, records uh, exposed. Um, this is, you know, this is one of those incidents. It seems like th this was known about. The breach was known about. Yeah. Uh, and disclosed some months ago, but now we're now some we're coming across the uh, the evidence of the breach, the actual exposed records. Is, is that? common? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. I've got some data here that I can share with you. Let me just uh, sure. share this slide if I can. Here we go. Screen share and then we're going to go over here. So yeah, are you now seeing that? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> there it is. Yep. There okay, cool. Yep. So this is some very recent Poneman data. This is the HP slash Poneman study that they do every year. I think this just came out within the last two weeks. And what you see here is some pretty um, sobering results, which is based on the survey they did, it took on average 416 days over a year to detect that a breach had occurred. 94% um, of those breaches were actually reported to the um, organization that experienced them by a third party. So that's often either a, a partner who had the breach and said, hey, by the way, we lost your data or uh, the FBI, who was part of another investigation, says, hey, you know what, we found some out, some connections between hosts that you own and some known botnets or bad guys or whatever we wanted to give you a heads up. And then finally, this one was a shock to me, that it took them 71% more time to resolve the breach as compared to the year before. Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of work to do 
as an industry, um, no sports you know person will be proud of any of those kinds of numbers. Almost <laughs> not of the sport. I mean, it's not not great. So anyway, let me go back to um, just live. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they're not alone, I guess, says this data. Well, we know they're not alone, actually, because this is the same server, apparently, where the data uh, from Adobe was discovered um, and uh, some other kind of prominent organizations as well. So it seems like we've got one group responsible for this, and then the data is just kind of parked out there on the Internet and um, not necessarily exposed to the public Internet, but um, to anyone who has access to that server or who can get access to it, as Brian Krebs has, with uh, with the help of a, a security researcher. Yeah. Uh, what do you, I mean, so for companies like, uh, you know, a Cupid, what is the response to this? I mean, the data is already gone, so you can't yep. really get it back. They've notified their customers. Yep. Um, does this engender any additional response at the company that they need to? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, one thing that you brought up that is important is the disclosure requirements. Um, you know, it's really complicated. There are 47 states, as you know, that have privacy breach disclosure laws. They're all federal. There are trade. There can be international requirements. Some of the European regulations are pretty stringent. Um, and if that weren't bad enough, just navigating this is complicated because it depends sometimes on number of records, the type of data, Sometimes it has to be two or three things together to warrant disclosure. When it's emails and names, people are generally giving people a light heads up. It's when you start to get to more sensitive information that um, not only is it required, you don't have a lot of time necessarily to do it, and the fines can be pretty severe um, if you don't get those notifications out in time. So just navigating, even if you've got perfect data, I know exactly what data was compromised, getting from that to, all right, what do I now need to do is not easy. Right. And, um, you know, as some of the data we just talked about indicates, even once you know that, actually making it happen and getting everybody working together, make, keeping everybody on the same page to make sure that you get all that stuff done in a timely fashion, also not easy. State of the art, a lot of places to do that, spreadsheets and conference calls. Yeah. Not, yeah. not an ideal scenario. Um, right, right. Yeah. Kind of ch ch just checklists like you'd, like you'd have for any other project. Um, and, and this is a, we should add, uh, this is an Australian company, which I actually wasn't aware of. Uh, so they're based outside the U.S. And then, you know, 42 million uh, customers, 30 websites. Um, we're going to assume that this is a global uh, exactly. victim. You know, the people affected by this are not merely in the United States or even the U.S. and Australia, but they're all yeah. over the place. So you're dealing with many different regulatory regimes covering what it is that you need to do. Yeah. It's a mess. That's really a really complicated scenario, you know, and um, relative to what do they do, uh, well, there's a, there's a, after they get all that work done, certainly what they need to do is do a, a post-mortem on, you know, what happened with the situation? What mitigated controls can we put in place to try to make sure that this doesn't happen again? How did we do with the response generally? Not just the IT components of it, but if you had to do disclosures, did those go out in a timely fashion? Was the wording in the communications plan, did we, was that effective or could we have done a better job with that? Um, there's, a whole, there's a whole raft of things that need to be considered so that you can then figure out, all right, now let's put some other improvements in place. They could be technology improvements, it could right. be staffing sort of changes or training that you need to do. There's almost certainly going to be process improvements where you realize, I didn't even know that we needed to contact this one organization. Um, we need to get their contact info, make sure that that's available to folks. Right. Um, and then after you've done all that, frankly, you should do a fire drill or a tabletop where you then try it again as a simulation, either that same scenario or maybe a different one based on other things you've experienced or things your peers experienced to try to improve your capability. Right. You know, often it seems like in these cases, um, the the origin of the breach itself is very difficult to determine. Sometimes yeah. it's coming um, by way of a third party. I mean, we certainly yeah. saw that with the New York Times and Twitter, with uh, Melbourne IT, which was their DNS hosting company, which is probably not something they gave a lot of uh, thought to, but ended up being a pretty big impact on their operations. Yeah. Um, you know, there was an issue with Zendesk. There was an issue with the Bank of America. How do you... 
what do you guys tell companies who are not only worried, like, you know, how do we address our own risk and respond, incident response internally, but also for the business partners and yep. companies that we deal with, our suppliers? It's often overlooked, unfortunately. You know, people will focus on the proverbial cyber breach yeah. uh, from abroad, and they'll, they'll, they'll prepare for that scenario. Uh, but fail to have a truly accurate inventory, prioritize inventory of their sensitive data, which if you did it at even a medium-sized enterprise, they, you would qu quickly realize that, well, not only do we have that data, but this business partner A and B also have that data, and that's when you then would expand your scope um, of your preparation to include them. Um, and that is not only a best practice, but you'll want to take a look at that because it's very common these days for there to be contractual requirements with those third parties around breach specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be subject to those, and in that case, you certainly better be aware of that and be ready to meet those requirements. Right. Um, or you should be thinking about them if you don't already have them in place to put those requirements on your pro providers, your partners who have that kind of data so that you can make sure that they um, adhere to a certain level of, well, this is how quickly we expect you to notify, and this is how we want that notification to happen, and these are the things that we expect you to do once you have notified us to get to the right side of the situation. All of this stuff has to, has to be included, and it really should be driven, as I said, by that inventory of what is it you've got that is the most sensitive and where is it. And once you start there, you can figure out what third parties need to be involved, put the requirements in place, and then practice, including with those third parties. Mm -hmm. How do you rate, um, you know, companies like Adobe, um, uh, obviously have been a victim of a cyber breach fairly recently. Um, is there, do you see some companies doing this better than others, um, responding to these incidents, particularly like in the case of Adobe where it's yeah. uh, really damaging to their reputation, there's probably a tremendous desire internally to try and, um, if not make light of it, uh, you know, not make much of it. Yeah, well, I think in Adobe's case, you have a very sophisticated organization that has handled this pretty well. Um, and that's, I'm sure, in part comes from the fact that uh, on the vulnerability side of their products, they actually have a very mature process and a very smart right. group of people who yeah. have been working in that situation for years. Yeah. And, uh, while yeah, they're, not, they're not new. They're not babes in the woods on the... Not at all. Well, it's sort of the other side of the coin. It's different situation, different circumstances, different group of people that you have to work with. But some of those skill sets in terms of trying to be pretty transparent with people, trying to be very direct and forthright, clear in your communication, all that stuff plays in spades. And so I think Adobe has shown that they've got those skills, no surprise given what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, whereas that's something that a lot of organizations, they would not have that institutional knowledge because it's right. just not part of their day-to-day -day business, and uh, they would struggle mightily with some of those things. In general, if somebody's doing this for the first time and it's a big situation, we see way too many people get involved way too soon. Everybody's got an opinion. You know, there's just a, a level of urgency that's just kind of off the, the it's, it's unproductive. It's off, off the charts. And that uh, the learning curve, usually after you've gone through this or if you get somebody really smart to help you do it for the first time, you kind of rein that back in. You say, all right, look, who really needs to be involved? Let's keep this on a need-to-know basis. Right. Let's try to defuse the stress in this situation. Let's try to set a game plan and proceed, um, you know, in a in a, in a, in a ordered way. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's what you need to do. That's where you want to try to get. If you don't get there, things will spiral out of control. We routinely see, because people panic, and because maybe it wasn't practiced in advance, and so people don't know what their roles are, they don't know what they need to do, that's when you bring in an expert. And that can sometimes make the situation even worse, because nobody knows who's in charge. Is it IT? Mm -hmm. Is it general counsel? Is it external counsel? Is it this third-party white glove response service that we brought in that mainly knows forensics, but they're trying to muscle their way into other stuff? It can get really messy. Yeah, and not that is why that fire drill and tabletop is just so so crucial. right, be right, because right, because that's not the that that's not the context or the setting in which you want to be talking about you know a new a new relationship, partner relationship, or or consultative agreement when you're kind of over the barrel. Um, yeah. uh, uh, 
kind of to that point of tabletop exercises, risk yeah. assessments, uh, there was an article um, based on a study from Poneman and the uh, security firm Tripwire that found only around half of health organizations were doing um, IT, kind of traditional IT risk analysis um, to identify vulnerabilities in their uh, networking infrastructure and, and, um, and so on. Uh, pretty surprising, given that you know this is a very regulated industry. I think we've got uh, HIPAA and certainly a lot of attention on yeah. security of health records. Um, what What are your thoughts? I'm guessing that you've got some exposure to that vertical. Yeah. Um, okay. Does that surprise you? In a way, it doesn't, because here's the surprising thing that a lot of people might not realize, and I'm glad this example came up because I think people overlook. So in healthcare, you have so much stuff that's printed information. Mm -hmm. And so, frankly, in terms of the breach situations they have, they have tons of small breaches every day. A nurse sees a patient record they're not supposed to. Um, the patient, you know, um, sort of prognosis got faxed to the wrong location or got mailed to the wrong address or emailed to the wrong account. So from a volume of perspective of number of incidents, not necessarily size, number of records, but from just a how many incidents do you have on a month-to-month -month basis? Any reasonable size health care organization is banging those out all the time, and most of them have nothing to do with cyber stuff. Right. Um, it's, it's traditional kind of, you know, I, I left the clipboard out on the table. You got and it. Like, oh, yeah. And the regulator doesn't care, right? HIPAA high tech doesn't make any difference. Your requirements right. are precisely the same, whether it's a lost box of paper records or a cyber breach where somebody compromised a database and stole a bunch of patient information. Right. And so um, that's where, actually, if you did the inventory of what your sensitive data is, that's number one, and then you took a look at what's our history. We can't prepare for everything. So let's prepare for the things that we know we're going to face um, or that we've seen our peers in industry face. You might, for a healthcare industry, spend a lot of your time focused on that stuff, and maybe you don't get around to a cyber breach. It's probably not quite that black and white, but that's where right. they may not be as practiced for a cyber breach, whereas for these paper record breaches, they do those in their sleep. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, and also there's, you know, it's, it's harder to determine when that incident has happened, right? So if you send an email yes. with patient information to the wrong person uh, yep. or somebody calls you and says, you know, I got this envelope with, you yep. know, diagnosis in it and it's not for me, yep. th there's an incident. In the cyberspace, you don't know. You might be finding out six months or more after what's mm -hmm. happened happened. So um, it, it can... it's a great point, Paul. And here's an example where they again are ahead of the curve. I mean, the the final ruling, the new update to HIPAA high tech that happened, I don't know, six months ago or so. Um, they added a new, more detailed risk assessment to deal precisely with this scenario. Basically, a lot of times you can do you can rule no harm. We don't need to disclose. You know, there's no possible way this could have been. Um, a real breach from the patient's perspective. Um, and, but HIPAA high tech wanted to at least force them to provide a little bit more documentation around when they're doing that so that they can, you know, detail that ruling or that determination and how they got to it and they can have that documented so that the um, Health and Human Services can look at that at any given time. They could do an annual review, for example. Um, so, and that's a best practice that I don't, I'm not aware is present, frankly, to that level of specification in any other vertical. Right, um, right. But probably will become more common over time. Huh, huh. Uh, okay, um, Security Ledger wrote this week about a workshop that the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, hosted in Washington, D.C. The subject of it was one that's close to our heart at the Security Ledger, which was security, privacy, and the Internet of Things. Um, this is a area that um, is still nascent, right? So these technologies are still many of them in the in the lab and on the whiteboard, not out there in the enterprise space. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's probably going to be changing in the coming in the next few yeah. years. How is that going to affect the uh, compliance regulatory uh, posture of organizations as? Um, You've, you've got IP-enabled, uh, you know, uh, appliances in your kitchen commissaries, and, uh, you know, your HVAC system is also, uh, you know, potentially uh, connected to the Internet and, and maybe even to your corporate network in some way that's hard to discern. Super interesting. Um, boy, uh, 
you know, you raid the pantry too often for those uh, trans fat laden <laughs> treats at midnight, and before you yes. know, your health care premiums it's, go up. It's you know, tweeted, like, it's tweeted to the whole organization, and that's who's, right. Yeah. Who's watching me? You know, and then, and then your health care provider Ted drops and you, and then you're about night. to have a heart attack. You know. <laughs> Um, I mean, yes. it's a joke, right? But it, it, you could see the same thing happening with fitness data, right? Near and dear to both of our hearts. Yes, hearts, right. right? The um, all these, all this data that's getting gathered about heart rate and um, fitness levels and all those kinds of things. What happens if that leaks out? And uh, again, what could that do to um, both the, create a privacy breach or just create a real business uh, problem? That's well, all. To my knowledge, and we're pretty, you know, deep in this stuff. Um, this stuff people are talking about. I mean, it's, right. no one set the ground rules for, for just to make it very concrete. Um, it's it's complicated, but each state has very specific guidelines about when you cross the threshold and it's a breach, and it has to be, you know, first name, last name, social security number, or right. something like that. Right. But for this type of data, I'm not aware of any standards whatsoever for, well, if it's heart rate and fitness level, but it's not tied to any pers personally identifiable information, that's okay. That, that's right. not even been determined yet. Well, and also, like, what counts as personally identifiable data exactly. yeah, might need works. to change as well, because, you know, and we've written about uh, even... The, uh, researchers have looked at the sort of um, pay-as-you-drive insurance programs and said, huh. well, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the pattern of how the car is driving, you know, its acceleration and turning, and you have a general idea of where this person is, then actually you do know where they're driving, right? So that information can be used to infer where they travel to and where they ended up at. Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might not know who the person is, but if you have the aggregate of the metadata from their mobile device, Absolutely. Um, then you can figure out who they are pretty easily. Um, so, so, so there may be some changes down the road as to, well, if you can paint a mosaic of who this person is, mm -hmm. the same as knowing what their social security number is, more yep. or less. Um, then maybe that becomes regulated data. You know, it also strikes me that, you know, organizations are dealing right now with the mobile device issue, BYOD, you know, bring your own device, yep. um, and the sort of influx of tablets and smartphones that are, mm -hmm. you know, powerful mini computers, basically, but often yep. outside of the control of the, the corporate IT department. Um, do you think that that is going to be that that basic problem is going to metastasize um, at, with with again more devices? So it's not just going to be mobile devices, but wearable technology, Google Glass, or or you know uh, some kind of a fitness uh, device you might wear on your wrist. And is that something that companies need to be paying attention to from a compliance uh, standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the big question around all this is just time, right? Because yeah. it's when there's some sort of major breach scenario that's particularly sensitive or it involves a particularly large number of people that everybody's right. going to freak out. Right. That will be the catalyzing moment that then forces regulatory change and all the rest. Right. What we can tell from past experience, however, is it's the organizations that at least attempt to think about this stuff in advance, set policy, and are transparent in the communication of that policy that, um, that will weather these things the best. And, uh, you know, you can just look at it from, we talked about Adobe earlier, and how because they have software products with vulnerabilities, they kind of nailed that whole process, and I think that really has been very helpful to them. Um, it's the same, you know, what, what did you learn as you go through that learning curve? Well, the first time somebody, a researcher, brings you a vulnerability, there's this sort of human nature thing to try to sweep it under the carpet, see if you can get them to shut up, right? And we all learned over the past 20 years it's a bad idea, not the right way to handle it. <laughs> you know, you're way I better off. I keep trying, and it keeps not working. <laughs> That's just me. Yeah. Um, you're way better off engaging with them. Hell, pay them to find more. You know, and sort of turn the situation around, make it actually uh, an asset of the organization that you're sure. so on top of this kind of stuff. And so I think the same will be true here. Um, the tricky part is you don't want to be too far out in front. You don't want to be the laggard, so striking that balance in between. So you you said yourself, and we're heading into next week is Thanksgiving week, so it's a shortened week, and then we're kind of in the holiday season. Yeah. Um, things 
kind of settle down for a few weeks. Um, but then certainly in the security industry, they wake up with a bang in February and March with, with RSA. Looking ahead to 2014 and RSA, um, what's Co3 going to be? What, what are your talking uh, points and what, what uh, are you following? What's interesting to you? Um, I'm really interested in not just the shiny objects. You know what I mean? Like the latest detective and preventative controls. Yeah. And, and honestly, I mean that far beyond just Co3. I mean, obviously, we have a little bit of a story to play there. But, um, man, um, the longer I spend in this industry, the clearer it is that in the same way that they didn't solve the problem 10 years ago, they didn't solve it five years ago, they're not going to solve it this year. That doesn't mean that you don't look at that stuff. It's super cool. Who doesn't want to be discover the next fire eye or whatever, right? Yes, right. Um, but on the other hand, let's tie this back to what we said before. Here's the situation you don't want to be in as a modern CISO, in this, given the state of breach that we live in. That's all you're focused on. You have, God forbid, that big breach scenario, and they say, well, you know, all you were talking about six months ago was a shiny object that you saw at RSA and you bought. I mean, haven't you guys run in, you know, a simulation or a fire drill? I mean, how could we not be prepared for this? That... It's not a place. That's not a place you want to be. The modern CISO is not going to get fired for having a breach. Right. When it gets breached. The best right. in the business get breached. But if you screw up the response, that's trouble. Right. That's not a meeting you want to be in. Uh, Salesforce. It's not, it's not hard. I mean, you know, the level of investment is so minimal on the uh, and the response side of things that a tiny bit can go a huge way in terms of improving your capability. So. I really see it as sort of balancing one's investment portfolio across prevention where arguably people are pretty heavy overweight, arguably, detection where they're probably underweight, and IR where response where they're anemic. Right. Um, and that, that'll be an interesting theme to see, you know, what kinds of stuff comes out at the show and how does it lay across that landscape. Um, and the degree that it balances investments, I really do honestly believe, will be the degree to which we kind of progress, move forward do a better job with this stuff. Right. Uh, so final question. I mean, we just saw the Dreamforce conference happen recently. So many companies are moving to services-based um, yep. uh, computing for, for any number of things, really yep. everything now potentially you can consume as a service instead of uh, deploying on-premises software. How does that um, complicate breach response and also you know incident response, breach response, and, and um, what are companies doing to kind of get a handle on, okay, well, you know, here's our IT environment, which we have a lot of control over, but here are yeah. these larger service providers who we don't really have much control over at all, yeah. but who yeah. are really integral to our, our company. Great question. So um, first, just in terms of disclosure, we're SaaS, but we have on-prem coming in a few weeks, so it's we're not religious about this. Uh, we, you um, heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but here's the thing that's really interesting about IR with regards to this question. And this came up from a prospect, actually. So I, you know, I can't name him, but I want to give you, if you're out there, I'm giving you credit. Because uh, it was an insightful comment. Um, they said to me, we don't do SaaS. And, you know, we didn't have on-prem at the time, so I'm like, oh, oh well, you know. They said, except for this. <laughs> <laughs> But here's why. He said, how could I, you know, really rationalize that uh, I think it's a good idea that when a product I'm only using because I know we've had a breach, I think that must be on, I think that must be part of our infrastructure. That's insane. It violates every incident response best practice. Right. It really has to be on completely separate, completely disconnected, unrelated infrastructure. Right. I mean, let's just cut right to the chase. If you're a compromise, the worst thing that could possibly happen is for them to know everything that you're doing because they then compromise whatever it is you're running your IR system on, and they see sure. every step before you even take it. Right. Um, right. So I think that'll be interesting to, to track is how many people get that and does it cause maybe people, for this specific category anyway, to consider a SaaS offering where they might not um, otherwise? Right. Because it's true just not only from a, you know, the bad guys are watching and they could know what's happening, but it's also an availability argument if it's a DDoS attack. Right. <laughs> right. Do, do it's SaaS... not available. That's the whole thing, right? So right. if the response solution is on that same infrastructure, bad idea. Right, right. And do, do, you know, do SaaS providers end up, I mean, Salesforce is kind of in a different category because it's an enormous company, but uh, there are many smaller uh, SaaS providers out there 
offering all different types of applications and services. Um, is there a kind of uh, uh, uncomfortable wake-up call for them in terms yeah, of the so. accountability to their own customers in the it's, event of breach? It's amazing in this day and age, the silliest of the things people still do. I mean, everybody, uh, if you're offering a SaaS product and you're going after enterprises and you haven't thought about secure architecture before you coded the product, right. if you haven't trained or have people who already understand how to do secure software development right. using a life cycle, um, if you haven't not only then tried to pen test yourself but found a trusted third party to sort of do that for you, ideally both static and dynamically, ideally a minimum once a year, even more if maybe you've got a major release. I mean, those are very, very well understood best practices. Right. If you haven't taken those steps and you're trying to sell the enterprise, you kind of deserve what you get, to be honest. Right, right. But it's very hard for customers to actually know, and most customers are not are going to look at, you know, what is this going to cost us monthly and what is it going to enable us to do. They're probably not... Um, unless maybe you're a large financial services company or a bank or something, uh, really interrogating that provider about, you know, how how good is this stuff? How well have you vetted it before you went, went live with it? And how safe is our data with you? Well, from our experience, you know, and this is not necessarily huge firms. Sometimes they're maybe just um, particularly at risk or smart. I guess I'm just trying to say you don't have to be big to understand those best practices. Yes. I can think of one client in particular um, I mean, gosh, there's probably 100 and 200 employees, maybe max, but they put us through all the exact same process, maybe not quite as stringent, but the same yeah. steps as some of our largest customers. Yeah. Okay, well, that's encouraging news. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Ted, Julian, thank you so much for joining us on um, Security Week in Review here with the Security Ledger. I really uh, love talking to you, as always. Of course, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Okay, we got to go out for a run one of these days. You got it. <laughs> All right. Take care. We'll catch you again. Yep. Bye.